It's Tuesday, it's 12.15 and we're live in Westminster. Joining me today, the former Cabinet Minister Robert Buckland, Labour's National Campaign Coordinator Shabana Mahmood, the SNP MP David Linden and the independent peer Claire Fox. Today... After this, should Boris Johnson apologise for the false claim he made about Keir Starmer and Jimmy Savile? They did mention Jimmy Savile, but they were mostly shouting about other issues. Um, so, I, so I don't accept the link that people are trying to make. I bet you Boris Johnson, whatever he tweeted last night, went to bed thinking, yeah, job well done. I've inflamed the mob. I've incited the mob. Today could see more new faces at number 10 as the Downing Street overhaul continues. To go green, should we go nuclear? This former Extinction Rebellion activist says it's the only way to achieve net zero. And should MPs be asked to champion inclusion and diversity? The principle of democracy is undermined by the requirement that we may be required to subscribe to behaviours to promote certain attitudes. You'll have seen in the headlines the video of the Labour leader Keir Starmer and the Shadow Foreign Secretary uh, David Lammy being mobbed by protesters. Um, it was quite close to Portcullis House in the Palace of Westminster and Scotland Yard headquarters. They were shouting uh, various things, traitor to the working class, anti-vaccination slogans and at least one yelled something about Jimmy Savile. Uh, two people have been arrested. This follows Boris Johnson last week in the Commons in a debate making a false claim about Keir Starmer failing to prosecute Jimmy Savile when he was in charge of the Crown Prosecution Service. Uh, now, a number of Tory MPs uh, since, uh, some of whom have put in letters of no confidence in the Prime Minister, have already called on Boris Johnson to retract the remarks and apologise. Today, another Conservative MP has tweeted this. Any smears against Sir Keir relating to Jimmy Savile are unjustifiable. I didn't agree with the Prime Minister raising the topic last week and condemn those yesterday evening if they believed it condoned their thuggish actions. Uh, Downing Street have said the Prime Minister has no intention of apologising, but Boris Johnson did tweet this um, last night. We can just show you that tweet from the Prime Minister where he did denounce uh, the actions. The behaviour directed at the leader of the opposition tonight is absolutely disgraceful. All forms of of harassment of our elected representatives are completely unacceptable. I thank the police for responding swiftly. Um, my opening question to all of you, if I start with you, Shabana, is there any link between Boris Johnson's remarks in the Commons last week and what happened to Keir Starmer last night? I think certainly in terms of the background to what happened last night, Boris Johnson's behaviour is what I would term an aggravating factor. I think what the Prime Minister bears some responsibility for is his own contribution to the degradation of our public and our political discourse. What he bears responsibility for is taking lies and smears off the deepest, darkest corners of the internet and bringing them right into the heart of our uh, House of Commons chamber, into the heart of our parliamentary democracy and into the heart of our public debate. So that's what I think Boris Johnson uh, does have responsibility responsibility for. Um, and I think what we've seen with the Prime Minister is time and again when he's got problems of his own and he's fighting to save his own job, and this is obviously deeply connected to his own woes uh, with his fellow Conservative members of Parliament, he will uh, flail about and pick anything that will distract away from the issues that the public want us to be focused on and instead set different things in train. And, and he's taken this slur off the internet and he's brought it into the heart of our democracy. And I think therefore it is an aggravating factor. His, his behaviour, he does have a measure of responsibility I mean, for the way we conduct your debate. Your colleague, the fellow Labour MP Chris Bryant, said it incited um, the mob. Claire, what's your view? Is there a link, though, in the way that Shabana has just outlined? I don't think there's any link. However, I want to untangle those two things. I mean, I spent most of last week, you know, ranting about how outraged I was by Boris Johnson using the Keir Starmer uh, attack. I, mean, I completely disagreed with it. Um, 
I, however, think it's very dangerous for parliamentarians to imply that there's an incitement element here. I mean, apart from the fact that that would mean that anything you said in a parliamentary context could be accused of incitement, um, you know, somebody, uh, a lot of the people on that, um, in the mob, apparently, were supporters of Julian Assange. I mean, I'm not going to change my mind on the fact that I think Julian Assange has been treated badly. Um, a lot of them seem to be involved in anti-vax campaigns, but it's also the case that lots of parliamentarians have rather uh, promiscuously called even people against vaccine mandates anti-vaxxers. So we get into a situation where I think that there is a problem of a kind of ratcheting up of uh, particular labels on people. But I think that it's far more dangerous if we decide that something that's said in Parliament directly leads to I mean, it's the end of free speech if we basically say he said that, they acted in that way. All right, well, it Dave, abdicates them of responsibility, by the way. David, what's your view? Ah, so Dave, acknowledge your sorry, just start, just start again because we just missed the beginning of you. So I think one of the things that's important to acknowledge, Joe, is that with leadership comes responsibility and arguably the Prime Minister is one of the most influential people uh, in, in the UK. And for him to stand up at the dispatch box of the House of Commons and peddle some far-right conspiracy theory, which was essentially a dead cat strategy, the fact that on today's programme, the fact that in the media recently people have been talking more about the words Keir Starmer and Jimmy Savile rather than Sue Gray in Downing Street parties, the Prime Minister knew fine well what he was doing last week, throwing that dead cat on the table. But the reality and the chickens are very much coming home to roost because that mob that surrounded Keir Starmer last night was whipped up as a direct result of the Prime Minister's behaviour. And, you know, there's a very cruel irony that yesterday in the House of Commons we had the new MP for South End West who replaced Sir David Amos mm. after his tragic killing introduced to Parliament. It's not that long ago that we saw another MP murdered, sadly. And so the Prime Minister, at the very least, has an obligation to take the temperature down. The best way he can do that is to apologise, call off the dogs, but then more fundamentally we need to get back to this Prime Minister's character, which I think is utterly unfit for office, and that's a view that's shared by many of my constituents and people right across Scotland. Well, uh, Robert, do you want to answer that direct mm. call uh, mm. there from David Linden, is call off the dogs and apologise. Should Boris Johnson do that? Well, do you know, I think it was a mistake. I think that it's a moment for all of us as responsible politicians to actually take stock and look at ourselves and say, are we, are we really behaving in a way that sets the right example? I think that implies to all of us, whether it's Angela Rayner calling Tory scum, whether it's uh, other politicians making personal comments, which we've seen. And, and you know, David is right to talk about the t appalling murder of David Amos. And of course, let's not forget Joe Cox, too. So we live in times where there is a coarsening of the discourse. There's an angry mob out there. By the way, I think this mob might well have surrounded Boris Johnson yesterday had he been out but, in the but street. Is, so they did. Apologize, they, is well, that what you're building up but, to well, say? I, look, I think all of us in public life, including, including the, Prime, the Minister, Prime Minister, need to say enough. I want to stop this. I want all this to stop well, and us to move on in a more responsible that does, way. He, does he lead by example then? Should he retract what he said? Well, look, I, I think that uh, I think it's a moment for all of us, including the Prime Minister, to say, do you know what? Let us conduct our uh, uh, debates in a more respectful manner from now on. Let us draw a line under what has happened and move on in a far more civilised and grown-up way. If we want to move on, that does require a grown-up attitude and an apology. Hang on, David. Hang on, David. I'm just going to let Shabana uh, respond. The Prime Minister sets the tone of how our public discourse is conducted. And uh, as, as Robert used the example of my friend and colleague Angela Rayner, she did... She did use the phrase scum, but then she also retracted it and made Eventually. a fulsome apology. She, but she did make a fulsome apology. And if the Prime Minister wants to follow her example and offer a fulsome apology, that's the way to do it. That's the way to reset what our expectations are. No Prime Minister of the day should be concerned with free speech uh, concerns when they're at the dispatch box, but they should be concerned to not whip up an already febrile atmosphere right. and to add to the general frenzy that we know is out there. He shouldn't be... He shouldn't be Adding to that, right. he should be trying to take the temperature down. Very briefly, because we've got a lot to get through. Claire and then David, a final mm. word. The leader of David's party actually called, uh, used unparliamentary language and called the Prime Minister a liar at the dispatch box. If um, somebody mobbed a Conservative and called them a liar, I wouldn't necessarily say that the leader of the SNP was responsible for that. That's one of the points I'm trying to make. It doesn't mean I condone either. But it's also the case that, you know, I've made this public before that... I actually decided, having decided not to stand for the Brexit party, I decided to stand having heard um, David Lammy, for example, call Conservatives who uh, supported leaving the EU as worse than Nazis. I mean, I am actually keen on us stopping demonising people in a particular way. I just don't want this 
to be seen. And uh, uh, even the connection, by the way, with David Amos, I mean, I think that's actually quite irresponsible. I mean, there was a very particular killing, murder, vile, horrible, related, completely unrelated to this. Right. And to try and link them all in in this way, that actually is misinformation and defamatory, in my view. David, you respond? Well, well, it's certainly not misinformation to say that the Prime Minister misled the House of Commons. Now, I can safely say that in a BBC studio, but if I say that in the House of Commons, I'll get chucked out. And the fact that there's more of a sanction for saying quite legitimately that the Prime Minister lied to Parliament rather than well, peddling the a far-right conspiracy there's, theory... See, there's, there's the there's problem, problem, David. David, that's a wider the, hang on, let, let's just finish, finish his point. Moment. This is part of a pattern of behaviour from the Prime Minister. This is not the first time that he's used deeply emotive language in the House of Commons. Robert, I'm sure, will remember that during the, the last Parliament when we were discussing Brexit, the Prime Minister regularly talking about the Surrender Bill. That led to mobs and, and, and people whipping up hatred in our mm. inboxes and on social media about right. being traitors and surrendering. So the Prime Minister must realise right. that with leadership comes responsibility. Right, and Robert, he's not fulfilling that leadership. I'm going to give uh, Robert the final word on this because we're going to come back yeah. to the issue yes. of language and free speech at the end of the programme if with, we have time. With respect, I mean, look, there's far too much moral relativism there with well. David. I'm afraid the SNP, you know, often uh, demonise people who oppose them in, in ways that I think, you know, cross the line sometimes. And I think all of us need to stand back and reflect. That mob yesterday, they were the same mob that surrounded Michael Gove outside his department. They were the same mob that attacked Nick Watt. These are people who do it not discriminate. Right. They just hate all of us because we represent the so called establishment. They do not discriminate. All right. We're going to talk about uh, the overhaul at Downing Street. Uh, we discussed it yesterday. There are more changes afoot in terms of key members of staff at number 10, uh, included a new chief of staff and a new director of communications, uh, a fairly colourful day for Gitto Harry, um, who described the Prime Minister as not a complete clown and also <laughs> told how he and the Prime Minister sang <coughs> I Will Survive when they met to discuss the appointment on Friday. Friday. Um, do you think it's going well, the Downing Street reset? Well, I, I think Gitto Harry's a breath of fresh air. I've known him for many years from Welsh politics and Welsh public life, and I think he brings an honesty and also a sense of uh, working to a norm within pa parameters. I do not believe that with that communications director we'll see the sort of uh, disruptive, divisive politics that some have accused uh, Number 10 of in the past. Yes. I think he'll be far more of a return to the norm. Right, although you did say in the Commons last week, you've sort of repeated it here on the programme, that you asked the Prime Minister to show the appropriate tone and approach. Do you think that has been demonstrated so far? I know I read those just two examples. Well, but... I, I really don't mind the Prime Minister singing a Gloria Gaynor song. Good luck to him. I mean, I sing regularly, as many <laughs> viewers of this programme know. But what I do expect in terms of... Uh, there's a difference, I think, between taking yourself seriously and taking the job seriously. What I want is a person who will take take the job utterly seriously at all times. It's, mm. it's a huge responsibility and it's that seriousness yeah. of purpose but that But is he I, demonstrating that? Uh, because you said, you, you asked him, in other words, implying that he wasn't or didn't adopt well, the appropriate tone and approach. I, I think the test has been set. I want to see that approach now in, in the weeks and months ahead. Right. Uh, you mentioned Gitto Harry, uh, the new Director of Communications. He worked with Boris Johnson when he was uh, Mayor of London in City Hall. You say he'll be a breath of fresh air. Are you completely satisfied that all the necessary security checks have have been carried out uh, regarding Gitto Harry's previous uh, lobbying of uh, the former number 10 chief of staff um, trying to stop Huawei, the Chinese firm, mm. being uh, banned? Well, I don't know. I'm not privy, but I would hope that all those appropriate checks would have been done so that uh, declarations are made and that there is no either perception of or actual uh, case of a conflict of interest. That surely has to be dealt with first and foremost. All right. Well, one of the indications of a reset for the Conservative Party, and we'll come on to Labour in just a moment, is polling. Let's have a look at this from uh, Redfield and Wilton Strategies. For the first time since we began tracking these questions in February 2021, Britons are more likely to trust Labour than to trust the Conservatives in all policy areas on which we poll. And you can see, I know it's quite small, but you can see there all the red bars for Labour are ahead of the Conservatives in every aspect, from supporting the NHS to protecting the environment. You've got a problem. Well, I, I, I take uh, that, that sort of uh, poll quite seriously. I mean, it is a poll, but uh, there's no doubt that uh, the Conservatives have got work to do in order to uh, persuade the British people of their case. I mean, I think that the case is strong. I think uh, our track record on investment in the NHS and now schools as well and the levelling up agenda, which uh, last week the White Paper actually gave a lot of more flesh to, is a very attractive prospectus. And what we as Conservatives need to do is get back to talking about what matters to people rather than talking 
talking about ourselves. And you know, this has to be a time now for the party to reach out to the country. We've done so brilliantly. Only two years ago, we won that amazing majority mm -hmm. right across the country. We now need to follow through with that seriousness of purpose that I talked about in order to deliver. Shabana? Uh, well, look, uh, I mean, I think that what we can see is that the government uh, is in trouble. Uh, the Prime Minister is um, desperately trying to save his own job. I mean, he's not a Prime Minister that's waking up every day, spending every minute of every day focused um, on the concerns of people across our country. And there's a cost of living crisis. We know people are very worried about having to make the choice between heating and eating. Um, and, and, and the Prime Minister, actually, what's he doing? He's resetting his own leadership for the umpteenth time. He's desperately trying to bring fresh faces into number 10. All these people who have some questions of their own to answer what he's laser like focused on is basically telling his own MPs that they'll have to bring in a tank to move him from Downing Street that's not a prime minister that's engaged with the concerns of the public I think you're starting to see that in some some of the polls do, um, do you think part of the reason Labour is ahead um, in all these areas and aspects of policy is because Boris Johnson is prime minister well, I think that certainly people are now seeing the character of Boris Johnson being revealed, and I think that certainly nobody can underestimate the impact that so-called party gate has had, the idea that the Prime Minister has been making rules for the rest of us that he hasn't been following himself, that has caused people to, you know, mm. take stock of whether they can trust this Prime Minister. But it might be better think... for him to stay a bit longer than perhaps you're asking for. <laughs> I mean, that in the end is a matter for the Conservative Party. All right. Let's, well, let's, let me just show you this tweet from the um, academic and author Matt Goodwin. It says, good to see people finally realising that most of the Conservative voters leaving the party, he says, are not switching to Labour. They're drifting into apathy. History suggests they'll return if, one, the PM gets back to core message, and two, as the prospect of Labour SNP comes into view. Claire? That seems to be... That's certainly the experience of people I've talked to, because I, I suppose the people that I have most contact with, the people who actually voted Tory for the first time, having voted Labour for generations at the last election. And they, um, they are, it is true, very disappointed with the Conservative Party. By the way, not because they want a decent communications officer or care about the spin, but because of the policies. And actually, they were very critical of the collateral damage of lockdown in many instances. It's not just a straightforward. They actually um, are very critical of the mandated vaccines for healthcare workers, which, you know, frontline workers, things like that, and also net zero. So there's a range of policies they're disappointed on. But what I found is that they are not enthusiastically returning to Labour. Labour breached trust of working people. I, I'm not going to rehearse it. From 2016 onwards. And I'm just saying they are saying... And so my greatest fear is that too many people are saying, I've got no one to represent me in the next election. They might look to the smaller parties. That doesn't look like what they're doing. They're basically saying, I'm disillusioned with the political class. Right. And I think that's a tragedy for democracy. Obviously, I don't want them to feel disenfranchised. Well, let Shabana answer well, that. I, I was just going to say, I mean, nobody in the Labour Party is uh, under any illusions. I'm not under any illusions about the scale of the task we have. And we, you know, um, treat all of those voters with a huge amount of respect. We know they lost their trust and we're working very hard to rebuild that sense of trust. What I'm seeing when I'm out campaigning in marginal seats all over the country is that the people who stopped voting for us last time um, are interested in Keir Starmer, in our leader. I think that what Keir has shown is that he will be a very different kind of leader. Um, it's in a stark contrast to Boris Johnson, right. uh, for example. Uh, and, and I think that people are willing to give us a second look. But it's um, hard and, on policy. Don't you think there's not and on very policy, much difference? No, no, on I mean, policy, there's a honest. huge difference. So let's just talk about energy. I mean, the government has oh. revealed whose side they're on when it comes to energy because they've come forward with a plan that is essentially a buy now, pay later scheme. So it's ordinary people, working people, that would pick up that tab. We've said tax the people that are making billions of pounds worth of profit at the moment from the soaring price of, of energy across uh, I think a one-off windfall tax is absolutely the right way to find the money uh, to give people up to 600 pounds off their bill so there is Public clear okay. distinction between us and the Conservatives when it comes to how we would deal with the energy with the, crisis and with the cost of well, living crisis just, that's facing your, people I keep hearing, and whose side we're on. I keep hearing Conservative politicians saying uh, you know we are the party of mm. low taxation. Um, the number 10 new policy chief Andrew Griffith uh, vowing to challenge taxes and left-wing orthodoxy. He said low tax, high skills um, is the best combination for economic success. But you're a high tax party, a low growth party, and you're going to put up taxes to the highest sustained level in peacetime, according to the Institute for Fiscal Studies. Should you just stop saying that?
No, we're a fiscally responsible party, and the flip side With the of the highest tax fiscal take for 70 yes, years. Yes, but the, the flip side of fiscal responsibility is actually raising taxes. The Thatcher government did just that when times were tough, and they released growth in the economy and a, a new uh, era of economic prosperity. Now, what we need to be doing after the after the pandemic, after the huge costs that have been placed upon all of us, is actually make sure that we are responsible in terms of what we wish to fund. Now, uh, I think it's absolutely right for the party to keep on on its aspirations with regard to lower taxation but, but they are aspirations be, yeah, but we will not, not be reality. forgiven but we won't be forgiven if we practice reaganomics joe but the question we are is who bears the burden government yeah but i'm afraid uh, Shabana, with respect you, your policies first of all your, your vat cut actually benefits millionaires it doesn't actually benefit benefits ordinary everybody. people it and benefits our everybody. targeted council tax relief and our targeted approach on energy plus the warm uh, uh, homes discount uh, extension Min is a really minimal. sensible measure to help those families. But you both agree it's, on it's, a net it's, zero so, target outcome. And we'll speak about and on the that. Key we will thing, speak about that. You both the, agree? No, no, but the, 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 no, no, but the clear the difference, the clear difference is, is let who Shabana, bears let respond, then we'll the, move the on. clear difference between the proposals that the Conservative Party have put forward on energy and what the, we, the Labour Party, are saying is, 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 is answering that question of who bears the greatest share of the burden to help us co uh, uh, cope with either the pandemic or with the global um, uh, crisis that we're seeing in, in, in energy. And we've made a clear choice. You know, the companies that are responsible are making billions of pounds worth of profit. It is right that there should be a one off windfall tax but, to find the money uh, to help people with up right. to 600 pounds off their bills. That's a Which clear choice. Very different, <laughs> very different to what Robert and his party well, are putting well, forward. All right, I'm well, going to well. talk to Robert briefly um, because he left uh, the government last year. Former Justice Secretary, tell us what you've been devoting your time to. Well, well, since that time, Joe, I've been uh, returning to a campaign that I've long uh, held close to my heart. That's the rights and opportunities for people with autism and disabilities. And in particular, there are 2,000 people who are still being, in effect, caged uh, under the Mental Health Act, even though the government has said it wants to move on, it wants to change the law, it's got great new strategies. But we need to see delivery mm -hmm. so that people uh, in, with these conditions are supported in the community and, frankly, given opportunities to go into employment and, and to enjoy the same advantages that many other people in society So why hasn't uh, the government enjoy. delivered? Well, uh, I think that, um, frankly, COVID's got in the way. I think there's been a, mm. a, an issue of priority. My job now as an active backbencher is to keep pushing them to say, look, you've got good intentions. Now get on with it, please. And can we do more to empower people with autism and other disabilities? Right. And what has the reaction been from government ministers? Well, I think the reaction's positive. But, um, you know, I want to make sure that we turbocharge it. I want to see reforms to the Mental Health Act that have been promised uh, last year come to fruition this year. And I want to see the commitment that we've heard to, about under the, uh, the NHS long-term plan in terms of funding become a reality so that more people are supported in the community. You must be worried though that the money that is going to be raised by the increase in national insurance contributions to go towards mm. the NHS recovering from mm. the pandemic, do you think it'll ever well, go into social care and the sorts of things you're talking about? Well I've written about this and I'm worried about it because uh, with the best will in the world we know that the NHS of course does use money in quite a, an insatiable way. <coughs> if, if this tax raise doesn't see change to social care, particularly for the care of adults with disabilities, then it will have failed. And that's the big test that government now has to pass. All right. Well, as we're on air, Sajid Javid, the health secretary, is talking about that huge backlog. I think it's around six million people waiting for routine operations. That <coughs> presumably is what the government is saying justifies that national insurance rise. Um, let me just show um, all of you uh, the Telegraph headline. <coughs> um, it says North Sea oil fired up amid net zero row. Now, this <coughs> is reporting that the UK government is going to give the green light to six new oil and gas fields in in the North Sea. According to the report, the Chancellor Rishi Sunak and the Business Secretary Kwasi Kwarteng are concerned about the economic <coughs> impact of the UK's push for net zero and want to see the new oil fields go ahead. So first of all, <coughs> David, is it a good idea, six new oil fields? Well, I think one of the thing, first things that we've got to acknowledge as a result of COP26 <coughs> is that things have changed. Politicians quite rightly, particularly those of us who've got more tomorrows uh, than yesterdays, 
uh, have realised that we have to look again at some of the commitments that we've made. Now, that does not mean leaving behind places like the northeast of Scotland that are clearly very reliant on oil and gas. That's why the Scottish Government has come forward with a, a just transition fund with a real focus on that. But one of the things that, that was quite clear mm -hmm. during COP26, particularly from those young leaders in our communities, is that they want politicians to take big, bold decisions. Sometimes those decisions are, are quite difficult uh, in terms of how we, we move towards net zero. Right, so uh, is that a yes or a no then in that transition period to, towards six new oil and gas fields? Well, I think the, the, the key thing for all governments that have to do is that when making sure that you're, you're going to be on that path to net zero, you've yeah. got to weigh up every single policy decision and find out, does that get you closer to getting to net zero right. or does that get you further away? And I think that's a point that's been made by the First Minister and is something that's very much been under review by the Scottish uh, Government. Forgive me if I missed it, but are you saying it's necessary for all the reasons you've just set out? Well, what I'm saying is that we are moving towards having some form of just transition. You cannot yeah. have COP26 on your doorstep in Scotland and talk about moving in a path to net zero and then just blithely go ahead as the UK government are doing with a kind right. of business so as no. usual attitude. So that is exactly what I'm saying. Right. Claire? So I'm delighted yeah. about this opening up of the uh, gas and oil fields. I think it's rather too little too late. And I am concerned that one of the key things that you would want any government to do is to be able to guarantee reliable, preferably cheap, um, energy. <coughs> and I think we've neglected it. I think that net zero has got in the way. I think that since I've been in the House of Lords, I've heard the terms net zero mentioned more than any single other issue across the House by everybody. And when I've raised problems with, yes, but... Might we look at fracking again and the moratorium on it? Might we look at nuclear energy and the problems that we haven't actually got any? Might we look at the fact that the sustainable energy solutions you're talking about are not sustainable at the moment and that we haven't got the technology in place? And might we look at who's going to pay for the net zero outcomes? Heat pump boilers are a disaster. The electric car uh, target, it seems to me, is completely unrealistic. And it seems that they've completely forgotten. And, and the answer is, we will do what we can to bring the public with us. In other words, we're dragging well, you, no matter whether you like it or not, in the direction we have set. So I think we need to have better energy supplies, and this is part of it, and I'm delighted. All right, well, you mentioned nuclear. Let's talk to Zeon Lights, the founder of Emergency Reactor, which campaigns for nuclear power to play an important role in decarbonising the UK economy. Um, welcome to you, Zeon. As I said, you're now a strong supporter of nuclear power, but that wasn't always your view, was it? No, like many environmentalists, I was anti-nuclear power for quite a long time, but I think we've been having this discussion for so long now and we need to just reassess and look at the fact that the scientific consensus is that we need nuclear energy to decarbonise. It's in the, all of the decarbonisation pathways in the Internet, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports. It, it's true according to the UN, it's true according to the WHO. You know, we need to uh, really just uh, look at why we're investing in oil during a climate emergency when we could be building lots of clean energy and that means lots of nuclear and renewables. Right. What's the, what are the alternatives then to using more nuclear power? Basically, we can build lots of renewables, we can have lots of wind and solar power, but the data from around the world, the countries that have been able to decarbonise shows that they've only ever achieved it with quite a lot of nuclear power, hydropower where they have a lot of access to hydropower, and a little bit of wind and solar. So we can build those, absolutely. But then you need a backup, or what we call base load. Wow. And that's always going to be either fossil fuels or nuclear energy. So if we want to choose clean electricity, we need to choose nuclear. And actually, if you look at what's happened in France, they're a really good case study to show that, you know, it, it not only provides um, clean energy, but the, their electricity prices are really low. They actually have the lowest um, cost to consumers in the EU, which not a lot of people are aware of. All right, well, David, the SNP is opposed to new nuclear power plants. Listening to Zeon, has she convinced you to change your mind? It's either no, fossil fuels or nuclear power. Just, for example, we've got the, the Good Energy report, which shows that you can get a path to net zero without a reliance on nuclear energy, which is incredibly expensive. I mean, take Sizewell C, for example. I think the costs for that are in about £63 billion. Costs for Hinkley, £23 billion. It doesn't have to be like this. You know, in Scotland, we generated the equivalent of about 98% of our electricity from renewables. There's things like pump storage hydro that we see in Kruiken. So there is a way of doing things differently without pumping lots and lots of money unnecessarily into nuclear energy. 
which in effect comes back to those bill payers. So that's £63 billion, pounds, that £23 billion pounds for, for Hinkley and Sizewell. Mm. They go on to bill payers at the right. end of the day. So we need to move towards a, a cleaner, greener form of energy. And that's the kind of thing we're trying to do in Scotland. Zion? I've actually looked into this figure before. I've heard this claim that Scotland produces almost 100% renewable energy, and I'm afraid it's not true. You can see a full breakdown on the Full Fact website. Um, it's more like 56% renewables, 30% nuclear, and about 14% fossil fuels. This is to do with the way that grids and exports work. The problem is that we need cheap, reliable electricity. Ah. That means we need it 24-7, 365 <coughs> days a year. That is not what wind and solar are able to provide. They can provide days at a time. That's brilliant. But we need a backup source. And we said, I've just given an example where it's not a huge cost to the consumer. And the reason for that is because these power plants, nuclear power plants, last for 60 to 80 years, which is what we're seeing in France. They built over 50 reactors back in the 70s. In about a decade, they decarbonized. They still have an over 70% clean energy mix today. And they have incredible energy security and the cheapest electricity prices to consumers in Europe, which you can compare with Germany, who right. have had a different program of pushing for a green transition. They put lots of money into renewables. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but actually their phase out of nuclear has really you know, challenged them. They're not able to meet their climate targets. They'd have to, they've had to sign up to the Nord Stream pipeline, look, relying on gas, and they're actually importing nuclear energy from France as well to fill that energy gap. So we have to fill that gap somehow. So and it's not it's not correct to go against the scientific consensus on this. Oh, it's right. actually quite dangerous at this point because we need to be looking at bringing down our emissions, using the evidence, not right. some random rogue report, oh. but the scientific consensus. Well, um, yes, you raise your eyebrows there, David. Are you sure you haven't changed your mind? <laughs> uh, no, you, 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 can, you can take it as read that I've not changed my mind. And look, I'm very happy to engage in talking about what happens in European countries. Let's look at for yeah, new yeah, but Denmark, hang on, David, example. it's not just what happens in European countries. Zeon is saying that you're not actually taking the scientific evidence and basis for having reliable energy, that it would lead to intermittent energy, the lights going out every so often, um, if we follow the path that you are suggesting. Well, I appreciate that not everybody would be, for example, um, you know, familiar with things like pump storage hydro, as we've got in Kruken, but I think that's a really good way of making sure that you've got a sustainable source of energy, and we need to move away from this obsession with nuclear. What I was going to say is, you know, in, in talking about some European countries, you look at Denmark, for example. Denmark took some, some pretty bold decisions back in the 1980s about its approach to nuclear energy. Um, so I think that that's where we've got to move to, but... Politics doesn't have to be like this. We, we don't have to just have this binary choice where nuclear well, power is always in the mix. I think that we are, we're big enough, we're bold enough mm, uh, to, to look well, forward to how we achieve net zero. And I just you, don't think that on that path to net zero, right. nuclear energy is the answer. Are you big and bold enough to do that? And I'll come to you, Shabana, in just a Well, I, I think it's an interesting idea that, that, that those people who are arguing <laughs> for nuclear are being binary or that anyone's obsessed with binary. We've stopped doing mm. nuclear power. Mm. I have to say, I don't want to discredit <laughs> In her reputation, but I think that Zion has been fantastic on this and brave. And for speaking out in the way that she has as an environmentalist, she's been attacked by other environmentalists. So what I'd like to see, and the reliability point that you stressed and that Zion stressed is very important. We have to have a mix of these things. I'm not particularly into the environmentalist net zero target, as people have noticed, but what I can't understand is why environmentalists who are so dismiss nuclear well, and even yeah. things like the fracking and shale well, gas at home, I think are, have to be considered. We have a crisis. This is a genuine minute to, you know, all right, what's well, that minute to midnight yes, thing? It is, this is a real problem right, and the, people are paying for it. But maybe that's because mm. the government really haven't done the groundwork and there are genuine fears about nuclear energy. I mean, listening to David, I suppose the ideal would be to make that transition to renewables without having to spend all that money on nuclear energy. It, it would be, but Sion is absolutely right when she talks about about the essential importance of nuclear. I, I'd say this, I think governments of both hues have dithered on this. Mm. We had dithering in and the noughties. And then we had, of course, this issue about China and Hinkley Point that caused the government to really uh, think again. Now is the time for us to harness the sort of approach we took in, on the vaccine and actually really moonshot mm. what we need to do with uh, nuclear. It, Energy it security <laughs> for me, Joe, is the, is the flip side of net zero. And I slightly disagree with Claire. I think net zero is hugely important. It's one of our manifesto commitments. But you know, but you we the can cost will be very high. Well, at the moment, they they are. But, you know, energy security is the big price that I think unites all of us, bearing in mind the uncertain world in which we live.
Well, look, I mean, I, I would say uh, to Robert that his party really needs to actually stop dithering and just get on with it, make some decisions, commit, give people the confidence to invest. The difference between this country and what's been happening with other countries who have done it better than us when it comes to energy security and energy supply and net zero as well um, is that they, they have a better way of handling big public projects uh, and they make faster decisions. They get those projects in on time and on budget. And that's not something that the Conservative government has been particularly successful in in their term of office. I think that nuclear power does have an important supporting role to play when it comes to our low carbon energy mix and uh, to the extent that we need to invest in it in order to give us that energy security we need to get on with it um, and make sure that actually what we what we're focused on is making sure bill payers are not paying the price of overruns on these projects and they're not picking up the bill for dithering and delay but we accept that there needs to be a, a, a settlement by which we find the money to pay for these uh, power stations but they are very much needed 16 percent of our electricity at the moment mm. and I'm afraid uh, for what from what David was saying it's very easy to always say well here's another bunch of alternatives what you need is a proper plan that is realistic and oh. deliverable uh, for parties like mine which are committed to net zero uh, disagree very strongly with Claire on this but you have to have a viable plan to get there and nuclear has an important supporting role to play all right and uh, on that idea of overrunning a government project who'd have ever thought of that um, Zion lights thank you very much for joining us today we <coughs> said that we would uh, talk and revisit the idea of free speech code of conduct, uh, particularly amongst parliamentarians. Let me just show you this headline uh, on Mail Online. It says, Prime Minister pulls plug on woke rule change in MPs' code of conduct. Boris rejects bid to add politically correct restrictions on what politicians can say over fears it will stifle free speech. Now, this refers to a proposal from the Common Standards Committee to add a new respect principle to the seven principles of public life, which would promote anti-racism, diversity, diversity and inclusion. But the government is reportedly planning to block this on free speech grounds. Claire, why would encouraging politicians to promote anti-racism, diversity and inclusion be a threat to free speech? Because if you actually look at the diversity <laughs> initiatives and the respect initiatives that we've seen being rolled out in universities, then actually we found that what happens is, is that you it has a chilling effect because there's a particular way that you have to show respect. You're not allowed to say certain things. And the point about anti-racism, um, which obviously, um, you know, anybody who's been involved in left-wing politics as long as I have has been involved in anti-racism. But now that phrase can mean a whole range of things. It can mean anything from critical race theory. It can mean saying that you have to go along with things like uh, white privilege, which I think are really destructive identity politics. So the, the most important thing for me about this code, and I mean, the, the, the male writing about it is woke and politically correct doesn't help my case, I know that, because I can't stand the word woke. And, you know, this idea that we're having a woke versus anti-woke fight drives me mad. But free speech and parliamentary privilege are hugely important. Mm. And in some ways, you have to just say that people are able to speak their mind and speak freely. Mm. And they, they should be held to account for what they say. I mean, they should be criticised if they say something that's... Uh, that's uh, demonstrably untrue or if in fact they're obnoxious or well, any number of things. Well on that then, um, as Claire has set it out, do, is there a need for this new code of conduct? I mean isn't it common sense to some extent? Why do you need this extra layer, uh, Shabana? Um, if it's working to the extent that people can then criticise others if they go too far in their mind, what gap is it trying to fill? Well, I think that, as I say, as you've said, it's adding to the Nolan principles. That's about how we conduct ourselves in our public life and what we as public servants are um, expected to demonstrate as behaviour. And I think uh, in that sense, having respect and, uh, and wanting to include people, you know, in our public life, everybody in our country needs to feel like they play a part, that they have a role, that their voice will be heard. And I think there's nothing wrong with saying to parliamentarians, actually, you are public servants, you set the tone for how our public life is conducted, and you therefore have a responsibility to make sure that people uh, everybody's voice can be heard and that you're committed to making sure that people are but not locked out of democracy in our political processes and I think interrupt. that that's the principle now, that, that, I know, that but, the but guidance we, we... is trying to get us into that space. Uh, I would also say though that the, 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 the chair of the committee Chris Bryant has been very clear and nothing in these rules touches parliamentary privilege or what you can and can't say. But the, but the difficulty we've got with something like respect, I just wanted to explain that you know it actually came up in the Lords and I was one of the people. I mean having made contributions on 
uh, the issue of uh, gender identity and the trans issue and, and, and women. It was uh, specifically in the uh, context of where we would house uh, trans women, whether they would be in the women's estate, the women's jails or not. You know, we were actually sent letters saying that there'd been a complaint, saying that we were being disrespectful. And then, of course, that we'd been transphobic and bullying. Now, as it happens, that was thrown out. But the idea that anyone even looked at it and thought about it, that was an attack on parliamentary privilege. And that has raised some well, great concerns. Well, the reason I'm saying is, when you say respect, is do, does that mean that you can't criticise absolutely well. ruthlessly criticise a particular political view if somebody's going to say, well, I, I find that fair. I think we can't conflate different things. I mean, these are this is guidance for how we conduct ourselves in public life. Yes. This is guidance for the, well, the, the behaviours we ought to be demonstrating. I think parliamentary privilege and protecting yeah. parliamentary privilege is a separate thing. It's and I think all privilege. parliamentarians will be united in saying that well, we take our parliamentary not, privilege well, very seriously. But at the beginning, Robert, yes. you did say you wanted everyone to conduct themselves in a respectful yes. way. And it all depends on interpretation. Yes. Uh, I might sort of add that some yes. parliamentarians don't remember how to behave in a respectful and civil way. So is this necessary or is it woke? Well well, I'm not going to get into the woke argument. I'm not sure it is well, necessary because when you look at the revised seven principles, and the Nolan principles are now, what, 25 years old, they've just been mm. revised, in fact, in November by Lord Evans in consultation. The word respect is in principle seven, under leadership. And I'm concerned that if we start to overlay this with more complex rules, we're actually going to confuse everybody here. You know, respect is, I think, easily understood. It's, it's not, a, not a difficult word. I think that in terms of how politicians behave, outside the chamber, you know, on social media mm. and in discourse, I think there is a clear uh, um, public interest in all of us reminding each other how to behave. But I, I'm not sure that this adds anything. And I think having a separate limb is actually to confuse the, the excellent seven principles which have worked for, for, for a quarter of a century. David, are they necessary? I think they are necessary because we're clearly in an age now where identity politics and the culture war is being very much waged by the Conservative Party and they've obviously decided that they want to do that in terms of an electoral strategy. I think the reason for going back and having a look at these rules is because Boris Johnson has changed the rules of the game. He doesn't play by the rules anymore. And bear in mind that, I mean, Robert quite rightly talks about the need for respect in politics, but the current Prime Minister of the United Kingdom is on record in the past is referring to Muslim women who wear the hijab as looking like letterboxes, referring to people in the LGBT community as being bum boys in tank tops, referring to black people as being flag-waving pickaninnies with watermelon smiles. So this is a Prime Minister who has a history of using quite incendiary language on a regular basis. And if the Prime Minister has got problems with people pulling him up on that, then I think that says more about his character and lack of morals than it does about the House of Commons, which is trying to put its own house in order and set a, an example for the people that we have the privilege of serving. Robert? Dave, take the moat out of your own eye when you make uh, allegations like this. We're trying to have a, actually a discussion about uh, the standards that need to apply to all of us in public life, and you've made it a party political rant. You know, we can point to plenty of examples during the independence referendum where, frankly, some of the language language of the campaign for separation was incendiary, it was divisive, I thought it fell below what well, we would regard as civilised debate. And I know you wouldn't be part of that, David, but let us actually campaign. try and have a mature debate. And what I'm talking about is respect, I think it's in the seven principles, let's all adhere to them and let's use this as a moment for all of us to reflect, draw a line under the incendiary debates that we've been having in recent weeks and move on. David? Well, no, I, I don't think it's quite as simple as that because the Prime Minister, who is the head of Her Majesty's government, yeah, is the kind of person standing by a lot of these incendiary comments that he has that made. But do you accept that all leaders, David, do you accept that all leaders and other senior politicians have fallen foul at times and used the sort of language that can inflame debate and discussion? There is no doubt, absolutely, Joe, that this is a plague in all our houses. But when the oh. Common Standards Committee brings forward measures to try and tackle this, and the government decides that it's going to wage a war on the walk by blocking these rules, that suggests that we're well, not all well, signed up to it. So right. yes, we need to take action, but that also includes the government, all which right. has an ability to lead. Uh, you've only got about 30 seconds. I think it's very important that we stop labelling people as far right, even labelling them as incendiary. I mean, I don't want, by the way, no emotive language in Parliament. It's mm. dull enough. We've got enough technocrats around. I wouldn't mind a bit of passion and a bit of principle. Mm. But oh. when you go around pointing fingers at people and labelling them, and we've seen it in relation to what's happened to Keir Starmer, people have said it's a far-right conspiracy. That in itself ratchets up the language. So we've got to be 
Stop labelling, but have free speech. All right, well, and we've had passion. free speech, I hope, on this programme and lots of passion. Thank you to all of my guests for joining me today. I will be back, of course, it's Prime Minister's Questions at 11.15.